sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Reuters detonated a huge controversy in the Apple and security spaces yesterday with this headline. Apple drop plan for encrypting backups after FBI complained. Sources. What plans? What encrypted backups? What complaint? What the hell? I am Rene Ritchie and this is Vector. Okay, so first, what Reuters is referring to as backups here is specifically iCloud backups. There are still two ways to backup Apple devices, to iCloud and locally to a Mac or PC. For a very long time now, and still to this day, you can locally backup your Mac or PC and opt into those backups being password encrypted. It's not a plan, it's a checkbox, and none of that has changed. Second, Based on reactions to the headline, many people, including very tech-savvy people, didn't seem to realize or remember that iCloud backups weren't quote-unquote encrypted. I say quote-unquote because the backups actually are encrypted, but Apple has their own set of keys and can access them, which is not unusual, like at all. There are a couple of reasons for that, features and fail-safes. I'll get to fail-safes in a bit, but Online storage not being end-to-end -end encrypted at the container level allows for additional features that can be highly convenient for the customer. Web-based access to single files within a backup, for example, including and especially photos, calendars, and contacts, like you get at iCloud.com. There are a few end-to-end -end encrypted by design storage services and services that provide options or local tools for end-to-end -end encryption, and you can always upload locally encrypted files as well. But iCloud is by no means unique in how it treats online backups, which is probably why some people reacted so strongly to the headline. Given how much Apple talks about privacy and security, some just assume it applies to everything. Now, Apple does treat some data differently. For example, health data and keychain password data are end-to-end -end encrypted, and Apple locks out everyone but you, including Apple themselves. To explain the difference and maybe the dissonance, I'm gonna flash back for a second. Many years ago, there was a scandal involving celebrities and their private photos being leaked online. Many, but not all of them, came from iCloud backups iCloud was never hacked, but if someone famous reused the same password as another service that was hacked, or used security questions that could be looked up on Wikipedia, for example, attackers could and did get into them. And Apple had to put a stop to it, and fast. No one but you should ever gain access to your iCloud account. So. Apple implemented two-step authentication, and the way they implemented it meant anyone using it had to write down or print out a long pseudo-random recovery key and keep it safe in case they ever forgot their iCloud passwords or couldn't supply the second step for authentication. Otherwise, they'd get locked out of their own accounts. And of course, people being people, they promptly turned on their 2SA, lost their recovery key, and got locked out of their own iCloud accounts. Apple was soon flooded with requests to help people get back into their accounts, but without the recovery key, there was absolutely nothing Apple could do. The data was lost, for all intents and purposes, destroyed. I've done a few videos about this already, but it's worth repeating again, always. For most people, most of the time, encrypted backups are a bad idea, precisely because if anything goes wrong, and things often go wrong, they cannot be recovered. Even a physical hard drive, if it's encrypted and it gets damaged, there's just no amount of recovery in the world that can get your data back. For InfoSec, information security people, that's the whole point, and they will always say to encrypt everything, because it's better to lose than to leak. Data retention experts, though, will tell you never to encrypt those backups, precisely because they've seen so many people lose so much of their own data. Unfortunately, given the times we live in, we've heard far more from safe everything than the save everything crowd, and it really is critically important to always consider both sides. Apple totally deserves some of the blame for this as well, given how much publicity they, like everyone else, give to security and how little they, like everyone else, give to education about what should and shouldn't be kept secure. Internally though, Apple learned that being extremists about anything, including security, is not only inconsiderate, but actively harmful. So Apple had to put a stop to people losing access to their own data as well, and just as fast. To do that, 
Apple deprecated the old two-step authentication system and rolled out a new two-factor authentication system that was not only easier for most people to manage, but would also allow Apple to recover iCloud backups for people if and when they locked themselves out, but could still prove ownership of the account. The downside to this was that, because Apple could access the backups, they were then legally obligated to hand over those backups in the event of a subpoena. Why would Apple make that trade-off? For the exact reasons I just explained. For the vast majority of people, the risk of data loss is significantly, significantly higher than the risk of data theft or subpoena. In other words, for most people, most of the time, the biggest danger isn't someone else, including a law enforcement agency, getting access to your data. It's you losing access to it. Apple, the company that would rather just lock up absolutely everything, decided it would actually be in the better interest of their customers to be a little less absolutist in this specific case. This is why, for the last five years or so, iCloud backups have been encrypted, but not end-to-end -end encrypted. Unlike almost everything else on iCloud, Apple doesn't lock themselves out so they can help you if you happen to lock yourself out. And, of course, for anyone not comfortable with that, there was and continues to be the option for fully encrypted backups available via Mac or PC. Reuters again. Apple dropped plans to let iPhone users fully encrypt backups of their devices in the company's iCloud service after the FBI complained that the move would harm investigations. This, according to six sources familiar with the matter. Reuters probably means Apple devices rather than just the iPhone, because there's very little chance the iPhone would be treated differently than, say, the iPad when it comes to iCloud backups. Now, yes, local backups to a Mac or PC can still be fully encrypted, but those aren't as convenient, and so people tend to be less consistent about them than iCloud backups. That's why, after Apple made the change from 2SA to 2FA, several people, myself included, understanding the risk of data loss, still asked for the option to turn on end-to-end -end encryption for iCloud backups as well. The question even came up in a Spiegel interview with Apple CEO Tim Cook, translated by Google. Our users have a key there, and we have one. We do this because some users lose or forget their key and then expect help from us to get their data back. It is difficult to estimate when we will change this practice, but I think that in the future it will be regulated like the devices. We will therefore no longer have a key for this in the future. Regulated here as in handled, not as in mandated by law. Now, Reuters isn't citing that interview as the source, but they are saying, the tech giant's reversal about two years ago has not previously been reported. And that makes Reuters' report problematic. Regardless of the source, it hasn't been about two years since Tim Cook's interview, where he clearly says Apple is working to end-to-end -to -end encrypt iCloud backups. It's been barely more than a year, not even 15 months. If something as simple as checkable as the timeline is wrong, what else may be wrong? Reuters again. It shows how much Apple has been willing to help U.S. law enforcement and intelligence agencies despite taking a harder line in high-profile legal disputes with the government and casting itself as a defender of its customers' information. But does it, though? Apple's willingness to help law enforcement has never been in question. Through words and actions, Apple has repeatedly demonstrated a commitment to obeying local laws, including a willingness to help law enforcement as required by those laws. This doesn't show how much because how much has always been shown to be much. The hard line Apple took with San Bernardino and is taking with Pensacola is completely different in kind because data on servers and on devices is different in kind and legal requests and extra legal requests are different in kind. Apple's argument about devices has and continues to be that they are far more likely to be lost or stolen and therefore require much stronger protection, silicon level encryption and that Apple can't grant access to law enforcement because that would also grant access to anyone who finds, steals, or otherwise gains possession of someone else's device. In other words, Apple isn't locking down iPhones to keep law enforcement organizations with valid warrants out. They're doing it to keep criminals out. The downside for law enforcement is that they get locked out as well. It's fail secure instead of fail safe, the exact inverse of the iCloud backup situation and the exact opposite trade-off. Now, 
I personally believe in, and I've made a couple of videos advocating that our devices contain so much deeply personal data that they're de facto extensions of our persons, and as such, deserve Fifth Amendment-like protection and exemptions under the law. But that's me. As far as I know, Apple hasn't advocated for anything that extreme. What Apple has done, though, is state that they shouldn't be compelled to provide access to data beyond the scope of existing laws, that there should be no extra-legal requests. That's why when attorneys general and directors FBI demanded Apple create backdoors and break encryption on the iPhones in San Bernardino and Pensacola, Apple said no. But even before it got to those pay grades, when Apple was legally asked for the iCloud backups, Apple provided them. Both of those facts were widely and jointly reported. There's no disconnect there, no surprise, no gotcha, not unless someone deliberately fabricates one. Reuters. More than two years ago, Apple told the FBI that it planned to offer users end-to-end -end encryption when storing their phone data on iCloud, according to one current and three former FBI officials and one current and one former Apple employee. Okay, so this is where Reuters' report becomes really troubling. Again, Apple is on record saying they will obey local laws, but encryption is not illegal, and the idea that Apple would involve the FBI in that type of process would be seen as an incredible violation of trust, given the relationship Apple has crafted with their customers. It would be, to many, a deal breaker. Apple's entire reputation is based on commitment to product and customer, and whether that helps or hurts the FBI or anyone else's extra-legal agenda shouldn't and can't matter. Product and customer have to come first. Now, there is nothing on the record that I'm aware of that I can point to either prove or disprove this allegation. It does seem to go against everything we know about how and why Apple operates, to the point where, if I were in a Dungeons and Dragons campaign right now, I'd be leaping up and yelling, disbelieve. But that's subjective opinion, not an objective set of facts. I have had numerous off-the-record conversations over the years since this iCloud backup system was implemented, and I've only ever heard that it was done this way, 100%, to help customers who had previously been locking themselves out of their accounts. Any benefit to law enforcement was unintended, but also unavoidable, the cost of prioritizing and preserving customer access. John Gruber of Daring Fireball, who has as good a sources inside Apple as anyone, wrote, My own private conversations over the last several years with rank-and-file Apple sources who've been directly involved with the company's security engineering is that men's sources for the Apple told the FBI that it planned to offer users end-to-end -end encryption when storing their iPhone data on iCloud bit, were the FBI sources, not the Apple sources, and that it is not accurate. Since anyone who wants to keep everyone, including Apple, locked out of their data simply has to toggle iCloud backups off, or, like I said before, use a Mac or PC to create fully encrypted backups, the damage to Apple's reputation from backroom dealings like this wouldn't be worth it at all, especially since there's no indication Apple has done anything to prevent iCloud backups from being turned off, or to remove encrypted backup capabilities from the Mac or PC, something that could easily have been done under the guise of dropping support for a legacy system. Reuters. Under that plan, primarily designed to thwart hackers, Apple would no longer have a key to unlock the encrypted data, meaning it would not be able to turn materials over to authorities in a readable form, even under court order. This also rings untrue to me. I can't think of a single case where hackers have successfully gained access to Apple's iCloud backup keys. In every case, access to data has been achieved by gaining physical access to a device that has the keys, or socially engineering or otherwise gaining credentials to access and restore the iCloud backup from another remote device. An Apple plan to enable end-to-end -end encrypted backups would only really thwart two groups of people, the users, who lose access to their own accounts, as happened in the past, and law enforcement agencies who want to subpoena the iCloud backups. Reuters, in private talks with Apple soon after, representatives of the FBI's cybercrime agents and its operational technology division objected to the plan, arguing it would deny them the most effective means for gaining evidence against iPhone-using suspects, the government sources said. I have no way to verify whether or not private talks really happened. I suspect but cannot prove there's a ton of broken telephone going on here. But if this sounds like something the FBI would argue, it's because it's something the FBI does in fact argue, all the time. It's also not accurate. Governments now have access to unprecedented amounts of data about all of us, almost all the time. In some cases, that includes cameras and other forms of physical surveillance. In almost all cases, metadata about who we contact, when, where, and how. Reuters again. 
When Apple spoke privately to the FBI about its work on phone security the following year, the end-to-end -end encryption plan had been dropped, according to the six sources. So let me try to follow this. Two years ago, Apple had this plan and spoke to the FBI about it. A year ago, they spoke to the FBI about it again, but said it was dropped. But that's also just about exactly when Tim Cook first mentions Apple was working on exactly this plan. This means, again, the timeline doesn't really make sense. Reuters could not determine why exactly Apple dropped the plan, which is a really interesting thing to say right after quoting six sources about the plan being dropped. Legal killed it for reasons you can imagine. Another former Apple employee said he was told without any specific mention of why the plan was dropped or if the FBI was a factor in the decision. Now, I personally can imagine many things, including Apple legal being worried about lawsuits from customers locked out of their data, even when it's their own damn fault. That person told Reuters the company did not want to risk being attacked by public officials for protecting criminals, sued for moving previously accessible data out of reach of government agencies, or used as an excuse for new legislation against encryption. But why not? Apple already gets attacked by public officials, the highest of officials, and very publicly on Twitter for exactly those reasons. It's not a risk if it's already happening. End-to-end -end encrypting backups is also currently legal, and Apple already does it for Mac and PC backups. They can't be sued for that either, at least not successfully. Reuters, they decided they weren't gonna poke the bear anymore, the person said, referring to Apple's court battle with the FBI in 2016 over access to an iPhone used by one of the suspects in a mass shooting in San Bernardino, California. Also, why not? Pressuring Apple over encryption isn't just a risk for Apple, it's a risk for the government as well. Because like we saw when they withdrew from the San Bernardino case, they're actually scared precedent won't go their way. As to new legislation against encryption, Apple has said they believe it should be a legislative decision. They'll fight it, of course, because it's in the best interest of their customers and their business to fight it. But as we discussed before, Apple will ultimately follow the law. And there's also no telling whether that law can or would pass. Overreaching information laws have been successfully defeated several times in the recent past. Reuters. However, a former Apple employee said it was possible the encryption project was dropped for other reasons, such as concern that more customers would find themselves locked out of their data more often. Which, like I said at the beginning, has been the only and exactly rationale I've heard from people at Apple over the last few years. Reuters. Once a decision was made, the 10 or so experts on the Apple encryption project, variously codenamed Plezio and Keydrop, were told to stop working on the effort, three people familiar with the matter told Reuters. This I really wonder about. It's possible those specific projects were canned, but my understanding is that this is a discussion that is still ongoing at Apple. And it's not atypical for several similar projects to be canceled in favor of better projects that ultimately achieve the same thing. That happens all the time. Apple is a measure 200 times cut once type of company. And implementing a new architecture that keeps out bad actors, but doesn't lock out account owners, but also allows for end-to-end -end encryption that's still as considerate and forgiving as possible is the definition of non-trivial and is absolutely something that has to be done right. Look at all the arguments we have on Twitter and in comments about what Apple can and should do. These same arguments happen inside Apple. They're not a monoculture or a hive mind. They're a diverse group of passionate, overachieving type A personalities with a lot of strong opinions about what should and shouldn't be done and how, up to and including the highest levels of the company. And everything from the articles that get written to the videos that get made, to the radars that get filed, to the off the record conversations that take place, help to inform and empower these arguments because everyone wants their opinion to win out and will take the best and brightest backup they can get to help make sure they win and stay one. Like with how health data and keychain password data is end-to-end -end encrypted, even in backup, that's ultimately why I'm actually really happy Reuters published this. Not because it set off some needless panic, especially from people sharing it without doing even basic due diligence or critical thinking before scaring people with ginned up controversies, manufactured outrage and conspiracy theories, but because it's an incredibly important topic and it just may help propel it once again to the top of Apple's iCloud roadmap. Yes, even as they're still struggling to fix up and finish everything from messages on the cloud to the last round of iOS 13 server-side iCloud changes. Which, by the way, if you turn on iMessage on iCloud and then turn off iCloud backup, will still let you sync messages between your devices, but will move the key from iCloud backup to your local device because this stuff is complicated. 
Personally, I think it's critically important for Apple to provide opt-in end-to-end encryption for iCloud backups, moreover, on a data set by data set basis. Because contrary to the hype, end-to-end encryption isn't always for the best. In many cases, it can be for the worst. Maybe I want my messages back up totally secure, but still want to access my photos on iCloud.com. I should be able to do that. Basically, anything that would be more damaging and harmful to you if it were leaked than lost, you should be able to encrypt it. Again, Apple already does that by default for things like passwords and health data. But you should get to choose other types of data, any types of data that concern you. And conversely, anything that would be more damaging and harmful to you if it were lost than leaked, you should absolutely not encrypt, even if you have the option. That's the way iCloud Backup works now and should still be the default because it's in the best interest of 99% of people 99% of the time. Totally not an easy system to architect in a way that isn't unnecessarily burdensome or error prone for end users, but totally Apple's job to figure out. And I hope Apple does figure it out and ship it and soon, even if I would personally never turn it on for exactly the reasons I've repeated here repeatedly. Not for me, but for the benefit of every dissident, whistleblower, journalist, oppressed minority, person at risk, or privacy advocate who would. It's how we prevent our society from becoming one of those dystopian futures we see in documentaries on CuriosityStream. You know CuriosityStream. It's the streaming video service from the creator of the Discovery Channel with thousands of documentaries and series, and now it's bundled with Nebula. That's the streaming video platform I'm building with a group of other education creators like Kyrgyzak, CGP Grey, Thomas Frank, H Bomber Guy, Sarah Z, Second Thought, Low Spec Gamer, Polyphonic, and many, many more. We're building it because we want a place where creators can try out new content ideas that simply may not work on YouTube, or simply for people who just don't want to watch it on YouTube. For just $19.99 a year, a year, you get access to both CuriosityStream with acclaimed content like King, a film record from Montgomery to Memphis, as well as all of the videos and increasing originals on Nebula. By signing up, you won't just be helping me out, but the entire educational community as we work together to build a place where we can create the content that you really want us to create. Just go to curiositystream.com slash vector for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series, and now Nebula as well. And enter the promo code vector to start your membership completely free for the first 31 days. Thanks CuriosityStream and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. So this is everything that came to mind for me after reading the Reuters piece. Now I'd love to hear what you think. Hit like if you do, subscribe if you haven't already, encrypt up that bell gizmo so YouTube will actually tell you when new videos go live, and then hit up the comments and let me know. Thanks for watching, see you next video.